The news is through, sweet sister. You are dead. You kept the lock of hair from this tired head. Since that day we met, I'm told, said my curls and thoughts were like your husband's. So a churl I'd have been to deny you. We were young then, and America was freedom's lung, I believed, when I asked you to sail with me to this land of the great liberty tree, but your heart was moored to old Europe's shore. Child of love and light, may your spirit soar and steer me onward, lead me through this mire which clags and drags my soul to a hell fire of self-doubt, that I have wedded the cause of human improvement and without pause staked my reputation, my whole fortune, my entire life on a wild, blind auction, bidding for an illusion and lost all. You knew my birthplace, Mary, and drank deep from the well of enlightenment, no sleep for our restless minds till democracy becomes reality, not prophecy. Yet that longed-for state is more distant now, it seems to me tonight, than the bright plough high above Cincinnati's candlelight. Since you breathe no more, who cares what I write or think? And why should they? Who can resist the weight of law and religion, the fist of finance that cloaks its blows with sweet bribes, until our brave new world and all its tribes are subjugated, lost and tyrannised by cool monopolies that brutalise? And it goes on. Um, yes, the um, I refer there to... Um, um, what's on her epitaph, um, which is, I have wedded the cause of human improvement, staked on it my fortune, my reputation and my life. That's what's on her gravestone in Cincinnati. The uh, Child of Love and Light is a quote from Percy Bysshe Shelley's dedication to, to Mary in his poem, The Revolt of Islam. Um, a year or so after I'd learned about Fanny Wright. I was filming in Shetland, playing a part in the detective series of that name. And on a day off, I visited Lerwick's wonderful Shetland Museum. I discovered a young woman there. She was thousands of years old. And although I was looking at her reconstructed head with her skull lying next to it in this glass case, um, she, she was, she was, um, I just, she was, um, she seemed more alive than anyone I'd met in a long time. I felt she could have been my, my daughter. Same colour of eyes and hair, same ski slope nose. <clears throat> Who was she? What language did she speak? Why did she die so young? They told us um, in a note next to her, her head that uh, she'd, they could tell from radiocarbon dating that she had died between the ages of 17 and 27. Does history separate us? Or does it reveal how much we have in common? I began to wonder whether I could write a poetry collection that would include this young Neolithic woman and Fanny Wright. I started ordering books. I used the Biographical Dictionary of Scottish Women, a brilliant resource, and it's about to go into its second edition this autumn. Everybody should have a copy on their shelf. It's fantastic. Um, I, but for in-depth reading, because that's just a dictionary, you know, with a little paragraph about each woman, I found that the books I needed were often out of print. Invisible women. Yet many of them seemed so contemporary in their sensibilities and observations. Take Mary Somerville. In the book compiled by her daughter, Re Personal Recollections from Early Life to Old Age, of Mary Somerville, this major international figure of science born in 1780, reflects on environmental issues, which couldn't be more relevant today. Returning to the valley of her birthplace in the Scottish borders, Mary finds herself deeply perturbed to see the River Jed invaded, she says, by manufactories. There is a perpetual war between civilization and the beauty of nature, she comments. And in her ninth decade, Somerville writes on women's place in society, and you really sense her frustration. She writes, 
Age has not abated my zeal for the emancipation of my sex from the unreasonable prejudice too prevalent in Great Britain against a literary and scientific education for women. The French are more civilized in this respect, for they have taken the lead and have given the first example in modern times of encouragement to the high intellectual of the sex. Madame Emma Chenou, who had received the degree of Master of Arts from the Faculty of Science of the University in Paris, has more recently received the Diploma of Licentiate in Mathematical Sciences from the same illustrious society after a successful examination in algebra, trigonometry, analytical geometry, the differential and integral calculus and astronomy. You see, she was just so excited. She, you know, the, the, the frustration that this wasn't available to women. And when the First World War broke out, uh, France delivered for women again, this time for Elsie Ingalls, <coughs> taking her up on her inspired offer of the Scottish Women's Hospital, um, the first all-women mobile hospital unit. The British government's war office had turned down Elsie's offer with the words, good lady, <coughs> go home and sit still. <coughs> Elsie ignored this man's advice and approached the French government. On the 5th of December in 1914, the Scottish Women's Hospital was posted to Royaumont. Its heroic work soon expanded to the Balkans and Elsie was the first woman to be awarded the Serbian Order of the White Eagle. In Serbia, where there's a monument to her and the Scottish Women's Hospitals, she holds the status of heroine. She's known there as our mother from Scotland. Another remarkable woman who received the same award for service with the Scottish Women's Hospitals, that's the uh, Order of the White Eagle from Serbia, was doctor and psychiatrist Isabel Emsley Hutton. In her fascinating autobiography, Memories of a Doctor <laughs> in War and Peace, she laments the potentially devastating effects of the marriage bar a common practice which prevented women from working in their chosen professions after they'd married. In this way, many brilliant women were excluded from the network of professional life, their careers losing momentum. And one notable case was the artist Dorothy Johnson, whose paintings were shown as part of the beautifully created, curated exhibition, Modern Scottish Women, Painters and Sculptors. I don't know if any of you saw that at the National Gallery of Modern Art in, uh, a couple of years ago. A real eye-opener. Um, the marriage bar was, was finally lifted in Scotland at the end of the Second World War, having done its work in relegating thousands of women to oblivion. But the culture of exclusion still continued, uh, as the artist Christian Small discovered when she applied for her first professional post in the late 1940s. This is after the marriage bar has been, um, been lifted, and she wasn't even married at this point. She'd just graduated with honours in chemistry uh, from St Andrews University. She got an interview, and when she turned up for it, the company realised they were dealing with a woman. She was called Christian. Um, a male or female name. They'd obviously assumed the, the, the name Christian referred to a male. She received a letter of rejection with the unforgettable words, we regret your sex. <laughs> and she kept that letter all her life. Um, there is a, a fantastic exhibition of her work at the moment, which is on in Peebles at the Chambers Institution, um, and it's on till the 2nd of September. She gave away most of her paintings. She occasionally sold one for two and six, whatever, and uh, kept a huge stash of them in her children's cot, in her tiny cottage. They were there when she died. But my aim in writing this poetry collection isn't just to highlight injustices. I wanted to celebrate achievements and to explore the richly diverse contribution that women have made to Scottish history and society. Several of my Scottish-born quines made their mark abroad, like Fanny Wright, for example. Others, like the 16th century calligrapher Esther Ingalls, a Huguenot refugee, came from elsewhere and made Scotland their home. We owe a huge debt to immigration. 
the slave trade, a debt, is incalculable. We're still witnessing the legacy. Windrush. What a scandal. It seems to have dropped off the radar. And that statue of Henry Dundas, <laughs> Home Secretary in Thomas Muir's time, Dundas, the man who controlled virtually every cog in the nation's political machinery, up to his neck in corruption, blocking abolition for decades, yet his statue is still lording it here in Edinburgh, towering over St Andrew's Square. Let's talk about statues for a, a moment. The debate about them tends to be simplistically <coughs> binary. It's either tear down these offensive symbols of the British Empire, the image of them crashing down like Saddam Hussein's one did, or... or leave them up uh, with a wee disclaimer plaque. But couldn't there be a third way? Nick Green, the feminist theatre maker, proposes a kind of guerrilla tactic, sneaking out while no one's looking. Not quite sure how he could do that with Lord Dundas. <laughs> and dressing the nation's statues, virtually all of them men, in frilly tutus. <laughs> Maybe. Satire's, satire's always a good ploy. But why can't we just remove these offenders without smashing them up. Lord Dundas, for example, put him in a museum and have his infamous story printed next to him for all to read and then put someone in his place in St Andrew's Square, a worthy woman. How about Eliza Juner? I think she'd be a really interesting candidate given Dundas's enthusiasm for slavery. I discovered Eliza Juner in an article in the um, Inverness Courier. She was born in Demerara in 1804 and she died in Fort Rose in 1861. She was the daughter of Hugh Juner, a slave owner from the Black Isle and an unknown mother, probably a slave. She won a prize for penmanship at Fortrose Academy, age 12. And I thought that merited a poem. Um, that was an achievement. Demerara, I've learned my letters well. My copperplate masts and sails flow across the page like the ship that carried us here, my brother and me, to our father's land, the black isle of white people, where I'm glad no cane grows. My mother always said I had a way with words. Demerara, river of the letterwood, its banks of trees with bark like hieroglyphics, a whisper in my ear from birth. Demerara, Demerara. I wish she'd lived to see my prize for penmanship, that I could tell her we are well and freed, that we don't heed the taunts of half-breed, octoroon, mulatto, quadroon. The Dominie's wife says tawny, told me she'd seen some in Cromarty too, had heard rumours there were others come to Inverness and Tain and saving present company, wasn't it a shame that Scotsmen didn't refrain from relations with slaves? She was pouring tea and her spine stiffened in her corset when I declined the sugar. But it's Demerara, she crooned. It'll make you feel at home and spooned it into my cup. I watched the gold beads, hybrid jewels, my father calls them, melt in the peat brown pool. Um, there were, thank you. There were lots of um, plantation owners in, in the Highlands and well, all over the all over the UK, and we are absolutely up to our necks in. Um, the uh, slave trade. 
in giving voice to my